Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Wednesday, January 26th, 2011, and our special guest is Michael Horn as he revisits the book Disrupting Class, now out in an expanded version. Uh, Michael, really glad to have you here. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for having me, Steve. Uh, really a pleasure with all the shows. Great uh, programming that you have, that you'd have me back. Oh, well, it's fun to have you back every time, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Future of Education is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate, now Blackboard Collaborate. The project I work on is called Learn Central. It's a social network for educators that is free, that has Illuminate baked in. We hope you'll come and take advantage of that. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, an another, uh, uh, actually it's not earlier, it's a, it's a little bit later, at 5 o'clock, uh, Pacific, 8 Eastern. We're going to have a community discussion on building a new network called Teacher 2.0, a, a personal and professional support network for educators. It should be a fun conversation. On Monday, Karen Cater comes on to talk about the National Ed Tech Plan. February 1, David Wiley will talk about open education. Uh, February 3rd, Karen Hume on her book, Tuned Out. And as you can see, lots of fun interviews coming up. Uh, recently added uh, Kevin Kelly, John Seeley Brown, Steve Wheeler, uh, Mitch Resnick, uh, but lots of fun there. hope there's something that is of interest to you. If you've missed the Future of Education show, they are all recorded. They're up in both full Illuminate form and MP3, and there's a podcast stream. Just go to futureofeducation.com, and you can see last night we had the every irascible Gary Stager on. Uh, lots of fun. Um, hopefully there's something there as well that sparks your interest and we make a difference by letting you participate in those conversations. Uh, just a quick reminder, we do have the Q and ISTE shows coming up where we do lots of fun things. Uh, both shows have an EduBlogger Con. This is a free uh, event prior to the conference, uh, an unconference activity, EduBlogger Con for Q is on March 16th from 4 to 8 p.m. You do not need to be attending Q to join us at EduBlogger Con in Palm Springs. Uh, in Philadelphia, it is June 25th, Saturday before ISTE, uh, and that's the full day. Uh, you can find out more information at edubloggercon.com. Both conferences also have bloggers cafes, uh, which are really fun, uh, a place to hang out during the conference. And both will have unplugged events this year. These are periods, uh, they're parallel streams during the conference where if you didn't get accepted to speak at SD or Q, or you had something you wanted to speak about that you didn't, pre you didn't uh, prepare a a presentation for, you can actually sign up to present there on site and we stream those out. Really a lot of fun. Love it that both these conferences are so supportive of our unconferency activities. That's Q and SD. If this is your first time at Illuminate, we're sure glad that you're here. This is a participative environment. You'll notice at the bottom of the participant window are some emoticons. You can smile or you can clap, give a confused look or a thumbs down. There's also a larger hand with the green up arrow that lets you raise your hand to ask a question. And when we get to the Q&A period of time, we hope that you will um, raise your hand and ask Michael some questions. If you think you might want to do that, do be sure to go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard. Make sure your microphone is working correctly. Uh, I find that it's much easier to follow the chat if I go up to View Layouts and I switch to the Wide Layout. So the default layout for coming into Illumina is normally um, uh, it's normally harder for me to see the full chat, so I recommend going up to your menu, view layouts, and select wide layout. So we're going to give you a chance now to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map for a wand with a red star at the end. It's the laser pointer tool. Click on that and then click on the map. And you're also welcome to do a shout out in the chat. It's often fun to hear what time it is, what the what the weather is like. Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, you're going to hear me turn the mic off and on uh, in order to cough. I have a slight cold and I apologize for that. Saudi Arabia, Netherlands. What a fun international audience, Michael. Something of a tribute to the 
extent with which your to which your work has been talked about in many places. I'm just blown away by it. Uh, looking at these uh, light up. So, Michael, this is really fun. We've had um, a number of interviews with you. Um, one originally around the book, and then some on the white papers that the Intersight Institute has done. Uh, Gary Steger tweeted, he came on the show yesterday, and he tweeted out uh, a day or two ago that he despised Michael Horn's work. Well, if you know Gary, that's not an unusual thing for Gary to say. But what was intriguing to me is just how hard it is for me to classify disrupting class in an easy categorization. I mean, this is a book that mentions both the Met schools and KIPP, uh, you know, within sentences of each other. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, could you give a quick overview of the book, and then maybe we'll sort of talk about what's changed in the new edition and um, what you've seen in the meantime? Thing. Um, so, so Gary's always a fun one uh, uh, to, to, to be around. Um, and uh, let me actually, let me turn my mic down just a bit, but um, let me first start there and then I'll, uh, with, 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 you know, your, your allusion to KIPP and the Met and High Tech High and, and, and so forth and just say, I don't think anyone should read our book and think too much about exactly what we have to say about pedagogy or how someone learns and so forth. We're not experts in that. Um, what we do bring to the table and, and this will launch into the summary, I think. Um, and, and so, so I, I feel sorry if, if Gary sort of reads our book for that um, and, and agrees or disagrees with me. Um, what I think one should read our book is that what we do say is that something that people don't disagree on is that people have different learning needs at different times. And we have a system that is built to standardize the way we teach and test. And if we want to break out of that system, then we have to move to a modular system that can customize for those different learning needs at different times. And one of the problems with reform efforts of all shapes and sizes, of all stripes, of all sizes of the political aisles, uh, is that they've approached it to attack the system head on or to try to make it do things for which it was not built. And what we've seen over and over again throughout uh, history is that uh, in, in all sorts of realms is that the way transformation in, facts ha in fact happens is through disruptive innovation. And this process that first uh, brings forth this simpler, often more affordable, convenient, uh, accessible product, and, uh, but, but is not as good as the original based on the original metrics. And it starts out by serving these people whom the existing system has never served and doesn't want to serve. And it starts there, and bit by bit, it gets bigger and bigger as more people migrate out to it, and it gets better and better. And over time, that's how transformation occurs. And, and what we see is that online learning is, whether, you know, no, no, regardless of what we feel, uh, is exhibiting exactly these uh, characteristics of a disruptive innovation. And it has these transformative properties. And, and that's really exciting because we haven't seen anything like it in education to this point. And if we can take it and put the right metrics in place that prioritize student learning and build a system around a student, not around uh, the monolithic education that we currently have, but, but a student-centric education, we really have this opportunity to make it not just a transformation in where learning is delivered, uh, but actually make it a transformation uh, that, that has the best interests of each student so that they can fulfill their human potential and really soar in our society. And, and, and that's really what the book focuses on, is how might we navigate that. Um, and, and we really try to take an agnostic take on the different pedagogies and so forth. Uh, Steve, I'm forgetting the second part of your question. I think it was, was it what has changed? Well, let's, if it's okay, let's pause there. And, and then we'll we'll get back to that. Um, I, th I think what you've described is really interesting because it's very easy to put, it's very easy to draw a distinction between education and business and find fault with bringing business ideas into education. What, what I found so interesting about disrupting class was your ability to bring a business principle into education 
but within a language or context that says, we think this could be really helpful in accomplishing what have traditionally been kind of progressive educational ideals. I think that's I think that's probably right. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I guess I, I, what I would say is I don't think what we have here at work are business principles either. What they are, are organizational principles around how to innovate, and they happen to have been first discovered and applied in a business context but they're actually universal beyond the business context. They describe how every organization works, what it's motivated to do, and equally what it's motivated not to do, what it's capable of doing, and equally what it's cap not capable of doing. And it gives a language for people to come around and say, okay, understanding what that means and how the world actually works, if we want to get from point A to point B, how do we actually get there? And uh, and, and I, I think that's sort of what we're, we're, we're bringing to the table and recognizing that certain parts of um, uh, education operate exactly like uh, our, our uh, y you know, the models from our theories would predict. Um, they, they operate as organizations do. Uh, now, the, the flip side of that is our, our theories don't have a heck of a lot to say which goals are right um, or, 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 or which, which end is correct. You know, we, we opine a little bit on that, but we're careful there because you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have all the answers there, and that's not where our theories lead us. So I, I think that's one of the reasons it was able to fit into that was, was we, we approached it with this humility that this is what we're able to answer, and there's a heck of a lot we just don't know the answer to, and we're not going to try to tell you guys what to think. Um, what we really hope we did was introduce a language that, al uh, that allows people to adopt this common way of talking. You know, I'll back up. One of the most frustrating things, I think, about talking in education circles and education reform circles is that people just talk past each other. They all use, you know, the same language sometimes and mean different things or they have different goals or whatever else. What we hope to do is just be able to bring a common language around uh, these questions and allow people to come up with counterintuitive steps about what they might do uh, to, to be able to meaningfully innovate, and, and not just meaningfully innovate, but actually meaningfully impact uh, with innovation at scale. What I've liked about the book is the degree to which the disruptive model has helped me, and I think many others, to kind of think about how change takes place. Uh, in the newest version, it's this question of uh, jobs that are hired and we'll get to that, that has sort of reshaped some of my thinking as well. So I'm really appreciative of uh, the dialogue that it's created. From the first edition to this expanded one, were there criticisms or feedback that made a difference in how you uh, changed the book? Um, gosh, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, abs absolutely, I think. Um, I, I, and, and, and and I have to sort through what was uh, an original idea versus what was a criticism or a uh, observation about what, what was missing now in, in retrospect. But, um, I, but, but the answer is absolutely. I, I think I gained a far richer uh, understanding of you know where we really had observed something that made sense and where we had gone astray. Honestly, because what I got to do after the um, after the book came out was literally just travel around the country, meeting with lots of interesting people with lots of different parts of the education landscape. And the book did provoke a, a very uh, uh, spirited, um, mostly positive, but a very spirited conversation on the internet. And I, I did my best to read, maybe people don't believe this, but I, I did my best to read every single review of it, every single blog, every single comment, and to comment back and have some dialogue. Um, I think a couple things that, that substantially um, influenced. One thing, that one criticism, people felt like we paid um, maybe too much credence to the Howard Gardner multiple intelligences theories when there is some question if that's actually the way the world uh, is organized in, in our brains and, and, and people have lots of different viewpoints and what the differences are between students and if there are differences and, and, and which ones matter and so forth. Um, that was an illuminating dialogue. What I tried to do in the book was not necessarily walk away, in, in the second edition, was not necessarily walk away from the fundamental principle because there's a lot of uh, research around that. Um, 
but basically to make it clear, I thought it didn't clear the first time, but make it even clearer from what I understood about um, I, not pinning ourselves on this is the only way you can think about it. <laughs> Where, you know, once again, not trying to make that judgment. I, I guess there was a second part of that, which I did feel more confident on from, from learning, which is that even if some people didn't buy some of the multiple intelligences or now learning styles and so forth, um, thoughts about some of these things, again, no one disagreed that people came in with different knowledge, seemed to acquire knowledge at different paces, seemed to get motivated by different things, um, and, 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 and so on. And so those things I felt very comfortable playing up and, and changing a little bit of, the, bit of the language to remove the word styles. And, and, and focus on needs and things like that, that sort of takes maybe a little of the sting out of it. Um, so, so I think that's one substantial part. A, a second part I would say uh, was on the description in Chapter 4 of the online, learn, of the, uh, online learning players themselves. I think I, I now have a much richer uh, understanding of what those do and don't look like, what they do and don't accomplish. I think we had sort of a naive assumption in the book that a lot of the online learning players were using a lot of the best in software that had been learned from uh, Netflix and Amazon so that they could learn over time what was working in, in real time, excuse me, um, and, and sort of not have very linear systems uh, and escape a lot of our conventions, and, and, and that largely is not the case. Uh, so, so tried to revise that a little bit. Uh, better understanding of the teacher, I think, in the new edition and uh, what they do and what, what the opportunity is and isn't. I, I don't think we were off necessarily, but, but we could have been even richer in the first go around. Um, Gosh, the, the, those are a few biggies uh, that, that I think. I, I, I think I've, I've been most stunned, and, and I'm leaving out sort of the, the, the chapter we most heavily revised and the jobs to be done chapter. I, I think I'm most stunned by how much seems to be proving correct. Um, the, the last thing I would say is I, I guess it's become much clearer to me that online learning represents this huge potential to, to realize these student-centric dreams, but it's, it's not a guarantee. And so I feel more confident than ever that the uh, prediction in the book that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses will be delivered online, I feel really good about that. Um, you know, it may be plus or minus 10 years on either side of it, or excuse me, three years on either side of it. Um, I, I, I sort of am agnostic on that, but it's basically on target. What, what I'm not, what I don't guarantee is that it'll result in a great student-centric system. I think there's a lot of um, uh, questions uh, as to that still. I, I, no, I also I saw one thing in the chat. I saw one thing in the chat room. I just want to be very clear about this. When I use the word online learning, I'm being agnostic to whether it's in, in a distance environment or a blended environment. Um, some people misinterpreted our book along those um, along those uh, along those lines. I, I, we never meant to mean online learning equals distance learning. In fact, we think, and we just put a white paper out about blended learning. We think that 90% of online learning will be in blended learning environments. I want to be very, very clear with that. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why that's true. Uh, I, I don't know why people, it's, it's because of the connotations of what online learning has historically meant that people felt that way, but we had vignettes that were very clearly rooted in schools with teachers, with other students, uh, to show that we really did always believe that for most people, uh, blended learning is where this will be. So I'm going to make note of the questions that are coming up in the chat and, and, uh, and a promise that I will try and uh, remember those as we get uh, toward the Q&A portion. If I miss them, of course, I'll ask you to place them again. Um, but, but we'll go ahead and just keep doing the interview and then in about 20 minutes shift to a larger Q&A. Um, I, I want to get to the new chapter, but I kind of had made an assumption, which I think was an, an incorrect because you had posted the new chapter on the website. I, th I thought, oh, it's just the addition of a new chapter. How significantly was the other material revised? And, and did you and Clay and Curtis all work on that? Was it largely you? I get the feeling that you kind of drove that. Uh, I may plead the fifth in the last uh, question, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but let it stand as is. Um, I, you know, I think. Curtis Clay and I had all had discussions about what we had learned, um, such that we were able to feel confident making those changes. Um, the uh, I, and I don't want to overstate how much of the revisions are.
are in, in, in the other part of the book. The, the, the real change is the new chapter, um, which we, we took the open source ethic and released on our website for free, obviously. And then we combined the last two chapters into one chapter and made some substantial changes there that I think make it much stronger and make the book end um, uh, in, a, in a much stronger fashion. Uh, but, but I think there were, you know, we always wanted to approach this that we were here to learn. And as long as people wanted to meaningfully engage us and understand what we were saying, we, we're, we're in it to all get better and try to figure out how to make a better school system. So I think we've always approached it that way. If we uh, had been able to, I think it actually would have been nice to actually re-architect the book in some interesting ways with this new chapter being the lead off. Um, because really the whole book hinges in the beginning on motivation being the central component uh, that, that can drive uh, a better learning system. And, and really the new chapter around the jobs to be done uh, is a central piece of that. And so I think if we were to go back again, we'd maybe re-architect uh, to, to, to really lead with that um, and, then, and then pin the book around that. But there was, lim we, there was limitations with what we were and were not able to do. Okay, That's, that puts us in a good place to sort of look at um, the chapter called Why So Many Students Seem Unmotivated. If you've got the new version of the book, it's chapter 7. Can you give a quick overview of what the concept is here? Yeah, sure, sure thing. So the, um, the, the concept basically is um, that, uh, that uh, sorry, that um, I'm trying to think where to, where to start with it because it's sort of let's, a multifaceted. Uh, let's, let's start with the milkshake story. story. Yeah, let's start, let's, let's start there. Okay. The, um, so, so the basic notion came out that um, the way that 75% or so um, of innovative prod products that uh, people launch are doomed to failure because of the way places like the Harvard Business School have traditionally thought about marketing. Um, um, the way we traditionally think about marketing uh, is we've, we've, we've thought that the world was segmented by customer demographic. So we have white males aged 30 to 49 or in schools we have first graders, second graders, third graders from rural, suburban, urban communities. Um, second uh, thing um, that, that marketing tends to have done was to segment by product category. So in cars, for example, we'll have subcompact, compact SUV, yada, yada. But um, in schools, we have elementary, middle, uh, high schools, uh, and so forth. Um, the, the problem with that was that none of this understands the point of view from the user or customer, uh, him or herself. Um, and it doesn't explain why one day I, as a you know 30 to 49 uh, white male, uh, choose to keep a uh, you know stay in with a movie from Netflix and a bag of popcorn, and the next day I choose to take uh, my wife out to the movies, um, and, and we go out. It doesn't explain why I do that. And, and to really understand that, you have to get to the level of the job to be done itself, and really understand the motivation for why someone is doing something. Uh, and so the unit of analysis, the focus has to be on the job and the circumstances around that job. And, and the, the, the sort of the story that we tell to illustrate it is, is rather a silly story, um, but, but I think an interesting one, which uh, in the mid-90s, um, there was a fast food company that wanted to boost the sale of their milkshakes. And so they hired uh, marketing consulting firms, and they had segmented the world by uh, product category and customer demographic. And they, uh, they in essence, said, um, you know, uh, we'll call in the average demographic that buys these milkshakes, which is one line item on the dessert menu, and uh, just get clear feedback about how to improve it, and then we'll improve it, and it'll get better. And so they did focus groups and all the rest, and nothing changed. Nothing changed whatsoever. So uh, one of our now colleagues, um, his name is Bob Mesta, came in and uh, he had a very different question on his mind, which is, I wonder why people hire a milkshake. I wonder what job they hire a milkshake to do. Sort of a bizarre question. Um, and so he basically stood at the back of the restaurant one day for 18 hours and he took copious notes of when anyone came in to buy a milkshake. And at the end of the day, he, he took notes such as when did they buy it? Uh, what else did they buy? Were they alone or with people? Uh, did they consume it in the restaurant or outside, on and on and on. And at the end of the day, he noticed something really interesting, which was that 50% uh, of the milkshakes were sold in the early morning rush hour commute, and 30% of milkshakes were sold in the late afternoon. 
and the other 20% were sort of a scatter shot. And with the 50% of milkshakes sold in the early morning rush hour commute, he saw that in every single one of the cases, every single person that bought the milkshake always came alone, they bought nothing else, and they would always take the milkshake out to the car with them and consume it, uh, and consume it there um, as they drove off. And so the next day he came back and he stood outside the restaurant, and as the people left with milkshake in hand, he confronted them in, in, in language that they would understand. He said, excuse me, I, I've just got this burning question that I've got to know, but when you just hired that milkshake, could you tell me what, what job were you trying to do? And they sort of looked at him in a bizarre fashion and, and, and said, what, what the heck is he talking about? And so he restated the question and said, well, think about the last time you were in this situation, this circumstance, doing whatever you're doing right now. What else did you buy or hire to get done whatever you are trying to get done right now? He said, you know, I, I think I got it. You, you see, I've got this 20 to 30 minute rush hour commute right now. And it's boring as anything. And I'm not starving right now. But I know if I don't put something in my stomach, I'll be starving by 8 or 9 o'clock. So come to think of it, last week I hired bagels. But take it from me, don't hire bagels because they don't do the job well at all. And, uh, and the reason is because they're dry and tasteless, especially if you're outside of New York City. And if you try to spread cream cheese or jam on it while you're driving, you end up driving with your knees. And if the cell phone rings, you've got real problems. And crumbs are all over your pants. It's horrible. Hired donuts once, but that didn't do the job well either. Because first of all, I had to lie to my wife about uh, the fact that I had bought donuts in the early morning rush hour commute. But secondly, they were sticky and gummed up the steering wheel. and It wasn't particularly effective at all. Now, another time I hired bananas, but this was the worst of all because the thing was gone in 30 seconds. I was bored for the rest of the commute. And by the way, it didn't fill me up at all. I was starving by 9.30. And I, uh, if you really push me on it, I hired Snickers once. But that was the worst of all, and I felt so guilty I swore I'd never do it again. But let me tell you, when I hire this milkshake, it just does the job perfectly uh, because it's so thick and viscous, it takes forever to suck up that tiny little straw. And I don't know what, they, what ingredients they put in there, but I don't care because it sinks to the bottom of my stomach and it keeps me full easily until 11.30 or 11.45 for lunchtime. And so it's just perfect. It easily fills up my commute. And by the way, God gave me two hands. I've always put one in the steering wheel, never knew what to do with the other one. And there's this cup holder here that it just fits perfectly inside of it. And uh, now I can uh, just, you know, drink very easily out of it. And it's, it's perfect. And so it turned out that the milkshake did the job better than all of its competitors, which were not just milkshakes from Burger King, Wendy's, and McDonald's, but those as well as uh, the Snickers bars, donuts, uh, coffee, bagels, bananas, and on and on. And when you understood the view from the job to be done, you understood what actually motivated the customers to, if you will, buy the milkshake to do whatever they needed to get done. And you also understood how you'd improve it. You'd make the thing even uh, more thick and, and more viscous. You'd stir tiny fruit chunks in it, not because they hired to be healthy, because they don't. But instead, at some random interval, they'd suck up a piece of fruit, which would keep the commute interesting, uh, and on and on. In the afternoon, it was hired by parents who were trying to um, uh, placate their kids and feel like good parents. And for that, you needed a totally different product, actually, to nail that job. And so understanding the world by job to be done really starts to understand and crack uh, the mystery of motivation and why people do certain things and not other things. Um, and so that's really where we started with this was what can we learn, and, and Steve, I'll, I'll keep going from there if, if you'd like, uh, about how we applied it to education. Or do you have any questions uh, about the theory itself? No, I think, uh, it's, to me, it's fascinating because like the disruptive model, it's not language that we're used to hearing in education. And yet you're going to make a point which is so, uh, to me, tremendously valuable in thinking about students. Um, and, and, and in the context of not having the extrinsic motivation, say, of tiger moms, you know, what are, what is it, what's the job students want to get out of school?
Yeah, and that's and that's really the connection um, with what you just said about the tiger moms, which is obviously extremely uh, relevant and in the news right now. Um, uh, is, is, is spot on, which was how do we get students motivated to learn and what job might they hire schools to really do for themselves. And what we concluded when we looked at it was that really students uh, were, were, you know, what, what job that they were trying to do each and every day was at its fundamental root core, they were trying to feel and experience success each and every day. And it turned out that, gosh, um, the, uh, the uh, you know, the school, the way it's currently structured, does a horrible job at that, except for the few people who really nail it and, and, and it really jives with their intelligences and so forth. Uh, you just think about it, the opportunities to feel success in school only happen uh, once every few weeks when there's an exam. It takes a little while for the exam to get graded and give it back to you. It's often graded on the bell curve so that only the top students uh, actually are successful on it. Um, if you uh, if if you look at a lot of the places where there are are opportunities with schools to feel success, like extracurricular activities, we do a very good job of calling them extracurricular, and actually moving them uh, away from from the from from the core school day and so forth, such that it's hard for students to derive that success. And so you look at what students hire when they can't feel successful in school, and 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 the other hiring candidates, just like is. With milkshakes, you could hire uh, uh, bagels, donuts, coffee, and on and on. You know, some kids will hire sports where they can feel successful and experience success. Some people will hire uh, the drama club or music or arts. Uh, others will drop out and hire gangs because in that environment, they can feel like successes. Uh, some people will drop out, get a car, cruise around town, and feel like success, feel like success is there. And it really has struck at a, at a chord with, with, I think, almost everyone we've talked to, that this really is about the motivation that they feel. And I want to be clear about one thing, because Amy Chua, um, for, for all the questions about the piece and so forth, she does raise a couple fundamental things. And one of them uh, is that we don't mean success just praising someone for doing anything. We mean real measurable success where the student themselves knows, I made an accomplishment here today and I feel good about it. And it really points to a lot of the research that in the past has been done around zone of proximal development or you can read in Daniel Willingham's book around always having the learning concept just above the student's interest, not too high, not too low, such that they get bored or, or disenfranchised. And one of the things that we concluded was that every student has this success job in their lives. Just because we see maybe couch potatoes sitting around watching TV and not applying themselves in anything is likely because they haven't had something that they can hire to meaningfully fulfill that success job. And if you understand that, well, gosh, that, that, you know, that, that calls into question a lot of the practices. And we, and we think that you can explain a lot of the successes of some of the project-based or constructivist schools through this notion of the success job, um, but also that you can explain a lot of the successes of online learning through the success job as well, where it's been able to give rapid feedback for students for how they're doing, always be targeting just above where they are so that it, it really meets them where they are and they can have those opportunities to be successful, and on and on. And so I think, uh, Steve, you know, um, this has really helped to explain a lot of things, but it also gives a lot of design principles for where both of those things sometimes go astray, if you will. So I'm fascinated by it. I keep trying to reframe it in my own mind with language that would be more sort of um, educationally centered. I, I ended up kind of translating it into, um, you know, I put it there in the chat, that, you know, the job that hiring is sort of looking to. So if the students are, are looking for six feelings of success and friends, then what solutions are they going to look to to accomplish that for them? And, and I'm reminded of uh, Jim G's, uh, the interview Jim G did here on Future of Education and how well uh, the gaming world seems to understand that need for um, having the experience be just enough above the, the player to have them feel successful but challenged at the same time. That's exactly right. Gaming is a huge element of this, and, 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 and it does it so well already. Uh, an interesting thought experiment that I blogged about a few months ago was 
what if um, video games were like schools, structured like schools are? You can't make progress until everyone around you has made progress, even though you've already beaten the level, so to speak. Um, vice versa, the class is ready to move on because they've all got, you know, because we've been told to, even though you haven't mastered the level. You know, it's not the case that every video game that takes off is this really deeply engaging story in and of itself, but it's scaffolded and structured such that it really does these uh, principles very, very well. And so I think it's why we have a heck of a lot to learn from the gaming world as we think about how do we build in uh, these opportunities for students really to see school as that pathway that they can look to. I'll use your language. I think it's a good one. Uh, look to uh, to experience success. I, I'll, I'll add one other thing. It's, it's interesting. The job to be done thinking is not widespread in business, right? It's, it's very foreign to all concepts, but it really tries to tackle at that root cause. And I think the language, getting that language right in both contexts is something that's really important. Um, to seeing it really take off in a way people can really do something with, because I, I still think that's lacking in it. Um, the other thing, just as a caveat, and, and, and one of the reasons I was hoping Bob might be able to join us, but we should do something at another point, was he actually got to spend time in a high school in Boston um, on a research project where he got to really dig into what are the jobs to be done at a much more granular level than we were able to in the writing of this chapter because we didn't have funding uh, to do something more in depth. And he started to see some very interesting things in that research that I think will get this even more nuanced uh, and, and I think will be very exciting. And, and we'd love to really do a lot more work here and, and unearth it because I think there's something fundamental here uh, that, that really really is important to dig out and, and to understand the nuances of it. And I would add to understand what are parents' jobs to be done in the system? What are teachers' jobs to be done? What are the district's jobs to be done, both from the superintendent's point of view, the the, the chief business officer, on and on uh, through it, is really important to understand why reforms will or will not have a chance of success because they really have to you know, if, if they're going through all these different stakeholders, they have to really address all their different jobs to be done. Yeah, I really appreciated uh, Kirsten Swanson put a note in the chat while you were talking, uh, saying, you know, what what do teachers hire schools to do? And there is this tremendous parallel between the experience that teachers have in school and the experience the students do. A line that really stood out for me in the book was, you said, we must start by correcting the notion that nearly all teachers and administrators hold, which is that education itself is the job. I think this is a critical thing, which is, again, just like, and this is one of the toughest things in any audience. Um, I was speaking with uh, some, some foundations this morning, uh, community foundations. Uh, th this is a very tough concept um, to, to understand, which is that the product itself is not the job. Uh, the, the job is much more, it's, fr it's from the point of view of the student in this case and how they see the world. And what we're trying to do is make education so attractive <laughs> that they will hire that service or that product uh, to, to do the jobs that they're already trying to get done in our lives. And it's, it, it's organic. It's not something that we can say, well, I wish it were that job or I wish it were that job. It, you know, People have jobs arise in their lives that have nothing to do with whether we like it or not. Uh, and so we have to treat the world as it is, not necessarily as we would wish it uh, would be, and, and start from there. And, and it's, that, that's a very difficult concept. I, I acknowledge that. Well, and just as that guy coming out of the fast food restaurant had a very hard time understanding the, the question that was asked of him, I think a lot of this exists at a very emotional level. So this puts into a language where we can think about it but I'm not sure the students would even recognize that's what's taking place, but emotionally they would connect with, well, I, I feel better when I'm doing this. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And, and every job to be done really does have, you know, it has, it, it, there's a functional component of it, there's an emotional component of it, and there's a social component of it. And um, everyone has these jobs to be done uh, that encompass in different mixes, uh, depending on their circumstance, those three parts of it. It's not just a transactional thing from, to get from here to, you know, point A to point B. There, there are deeply emotional and, and social reasons we do things. And, and there seems to be some good brain research that backs us up, too, with the success job, right? Um, when you feel successful, excuse me, when you are successful and you actually accomplish something and, and achieve something meaningful, 
your brain releases uh, endorphins that, that reward you. Uh, you know, not much is known beyond that at this point, but, but this really does, it, it's consistent with a lot of bodies of work, both on the level of intuition, as well as some of the things that we're finding out from the research as well. So there's no way we're going to do justice to the book as a whole, and especially not to the organizing to innovate combined final chapter. But I do want to touch on this because uh, this kind of rocked me a little. Uh, you know, here I've been doing these interviews and thinking about uh, democracy and the schools as a uh, needing to be more democratic in order to teach democracy rather than just being told about democracy. And you introduce this concept of um, the kind of what kind of governance you need to make changes that in some cases you say is not going to be democratic. So I'd love for you to take a couple of minutes and kind of explain that. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'd start off with Steve. It, it doesn't just rock your world. It, it rocks mine as well. Um, and and I, I want to be clear that I think driving toward uh, this more democratic um, opportunity where people uh, can, can fashion a system in that way would make a lot of sense. But what we have right now is a system um, where, um, and, and again, I want to sort of take our normative voice out of it and, and allow people to, uh, to, to shape it where they think it needs to go. But um, we, we have a system right now where people in society, direct stakeholders in education, do not agree either on the means of uh, schooling, you know, what leads to what outcomes, as well as there is very little agreement on how to get there. Uh, what we're, sorry, how to get there and the goals for, for what we're actually trying to achieve. I was redundant on the first point. Um, and what we've, what we've seen in our research is that when you are a leader trying to make change and trying to do something new, if there is very little agreement on those two dimensions, that is very prescriptive on what you uh, uh, can and cannot, which, which leadership and management tools you can and cannot use to be effective to get to your goals. And so all, all this is saying is that if your goals are X, uh, and, and this is where you're saying that you need to be able to bring the system, uh, power tools are what we call power tools, where you, where you mass power and you, you make decisions by fiat and all the rest are really going to be the only way that you can get from here to there. Now, there's, a, there's an inherent conflict that I want to bring up as well, which is that we live in a democratic society. I, I'm thankful for that every day. And there is a limit to how much one can actually use the, the tools of power in that context uh, and in the context of public education in particular. And so there's a tension where if we want to move education uh, to, to, to a certain goal, to a certain reality, uh, there is going to be a tension there of how much power tools can really do the job as well. And so it's part of the reason why we introduced this idea of the tool of separation as well, this ability to create this autonomous space for something like High Tech High, for something like the big picture schools, uh, uh, to, to be able to do things very, very different. Um, and, and, and so uh, in, in, in that respect, they, they, they are able to uh, construct those opportunities and, and, and be free of the system that is pushing uh, maybe in very different directions and wouldn't otherwise allow them to do it and exercise their degree of control to align a system that agrees both on the outcomes uh, that they're desiring for as, how to, as well as how to get there within this context. And by the way, if there's great success in places like High Tech High and the big picture schools, uh, you know, over time more and more people will move there as well. Okay, so uh, it looks okay, like so, Gary's uh, joined us, so I'm sure that the, the chat will stay increasingly interesting. Um, I'm, we're going to move to Q&A, and uh, I, again, I recognize that we haven't really done a full job of describing that last chapter, and it's one that I think is really worth reading. So if you've considered getting the, the new edition of the book, um, well worth uh, looking at and thinking about it. Maybe we'll come up again in the questions. But we're going to move to Q&A, and Kent, you've had your hand up patiently. I'm going to give you the microphone. To turn your mic on, you click on the microphone button at the lower left, and then I've gathered some of the questions that I've seen. Well, thank you, and <clears throat> I appreciate the, the book tremendously. I, uh, I have a feeling that uh, we haven't really discussed 
discussed who the most logical candidate would be for the uh, underserved consumer in education. And I would hope Michael might put a little more flavor in that. But I'm heretical enough to suggest that in order to uh, start work in this area, we might have to uh, identify some young person who uh, is not learning in the first or second grade, uh, suggest that we might put him in an isolation booth with an interactive program using artificial intelligence to allow him to avoid distractions of the normal class and to give him the very best opportunity to learn at least the core knowledge and uh, basic skills that he needs in order to uh, even move to the second grade. Uh, is there anyone doing actual work uh, to create this kind of uh, interactive, truly interactive, productive uh, uh, programming? So, so let me try, let me try to address that, Kent, on, on a couple aims because I think it's this is an important place where our research maybe is limited in what it can and can't say. But um, but then I'll answer your question directly. But I just want to bring up the point, which is I think that there are a few jobs that we're trying to instill at those early levels, and and one of them is uh, the, the core academic knowledge around literacy and uh, numeracy to be able to do uh, higher order concepts. But I would also say that uh, a, a big goal that people seem to share for, for people of that age is to develop into people uh, who can share and be citizens and work with other people and uh, uh, start to play well with e each other and so forth. So, so I'd, I'd be careful about describing an extreme there uh, and, 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 and so forth. Um, so I just want to bring up that point because I think there's a, a dangerous road to go down um, from my own standpoint, but, but I also try not to opine too much on that. Um, to your second point in terms of a, a tremendously adaptive system that can really do what you're describing, there are some limited steps moving forward into that. Um, there are uh, uh, some, some organizations uh, such as Dreambox Learning, uh, Newton, uh, Grokit, uh, three companies that come to mind that are starting to play around uh, in some serious ways with, with adaptive learning. There's some engines as well in China and places like that that are trying to do some of the things you describe. Um, it is still tremendously early and I think a key reason for that is that the market doesn't reward uh, people who build immensely adaptive uh, learning systems um, right now. And so the, if there's not a market for it, uh, it's, it's awfully hard to see how that sort of a thing, uh, w why people would put a lot of money into it. And I think that's one of the problems that people are facing right now. Um, Dreambox Learning is very focused on, on K through 3 math at the moment. So they are doing it and they are persevering through that point. Um, they're also owned by a nonprofit organization. Uh, the, the, um, the Newton and Grocket examples I gave have started in test prep, so far afield and direct to consumer, uh, where where people uh, seem to have been valuing those things more and are willing to um, uh, seem willing to pay for that, uh, and, and it's also more affordable in that realm for them, uh, such that that seems to have galvanized them. Uh, you know, some of this stuff exists already, obviously, in, in, in military training and in and, and some corporate uh, settings and so forth. They just haven't been able to find a way to, to actually target the elementary school. And I'd add that I think our book is, is weak on the elementary school prescriptions because we haven't seen those areas of non-consumption, at least in America, uh, that would lend itself well to disruptive innovation. So we've been a little bit more silent on those questions that I agree are critical. Um, what I think you are seeing is that in emerging countries, there are some more opportunities uh, uh, for that. And um, uh, uh, and I, I would expect actually some of those innovations to to take root much more there before they do here. So Dan has his hand up, but before I go to him, I'm going to take one of the questions from the chat I saw earlier. Gordon asked, have you looked at the barriers that local control puts to the growth of online learning? Uh, let me make sure I understand the question. Have we looked at the uh, the the barriers that local control puts to online learning, and so, in other words, with districts and so forth uh, erecting this place, is that, is that correct? That's how I would read it. Okay, great. So, 
Um, great question. I, I, I think it does uh, put some obvious barriers uh, in front of it. I, I'd recommend the Digital Learning Council, uh, Digital Learning Now uh, uh, principles um, to take a look at uh, that, that attacks some of those questions. Uh, I, I think narrowly defined uh, what you see is that online learning though is growing regardless of what we think of it. Um, and regardless of whether it's doing uh, uh, all the jobs that some people might hope that it does, uh, because it's acting as a disruptive innovation. I think there's a bigger opportunity that local control stands uh, potentially a little bit in the way of um, that, that, uh, that um, uh, pr prevents it from maybe targeting higher aims uh, around learning itself and around um, uh, cognition and, and, and things of that notion, uh, notions. And so I think that, um, uh, we, we've spent some time looking at that, and there's just a whole series of regulations in terms of how money comes down from both local levels, state levels, and federal levels that really cause everything in schools to look a certain way that they do and to really restrict the ability of groups from different parts of the district organization to even work together to do certain things um, in the absence of some stunning leadership that, that is not present everywhere. Uh, so, so we have spent some time on those questions. I'd recommend a case study that just came out uh, on our website. If you want to look a little bit more um, about how it plays out in different districts as a result uh, that uh, Catherine Mackey just uh, published uh, uh, about uh, the implementation of some online learning programs in three school districts, which, which you can get on our website at InnocenteInstitute.org uh, if, if you want a little bit more depth on it. But I, but I really would recommend the Digital Learning Now principles and thinking seriously about what that does mean for governance uh, going forward. Dan, I've given you, Dan, the, microphone. I've given you the microphone. There you go. There you go. Uh, thank you. And thank you. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. Um, um, I think I want to comment more than question. And I will say that I haven't read this new version. I did read the first version. And I don't think your position on governance is necessarily agnostic. I think you've actually taken a fairly, uh, you know, you've taken sides, and you've taken a side against local control and against teacher unions, and it, and it appears that you've actually thrown a thrown a bomb into our existing system without really offering a alternative that we can actually use, and. I think it's a bit irresponsible to go around throwing bombs without, you know, providing for something that we can actually use in the place of it. So, so let me just let me just briefly say that um, I I I, I hoped um, that in the introduction we were very clear that we did not see uh, you, you mentioned unions as one. Uh, we did not see that as the root cause of the problem. Um, uh, I, I do think that unions, just like many other organizations, have uh, within the stakeholder environment have their interests at heart, and at some point become about their interests. Um, what I would push back on is saying that we're not working to develop uh, a little bit of what that alternative might look like. I, I think that's, uh, to some degree, the uh, exercise we're engaged in. But I would also um, add to that: uh, I don't want to prejudge it because there's a heck of a lot of stuff that I'm A, wrong on, and B, don't know about. Um, and so I try to be, so, so I know where Gary, you know, Steger, who's in this chat, um, comes, out, comes out on, um, on, on, on certain questions. And I, I don't really want to push back against him on those things because I don't know. I'm not an expert on someone that um, debates uh, 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 some of these things. And so there I try to, try to be a little bit more agnostic. Um, by definition, public education, uh, is, is at the whims of, of, of those who are governed to some degree. And so uh, that conversation around setting standards and so forth that, that is happening, uh, you know, I think is a tremendous opportunity to set the right standards. But if uh, there's disagreement on that and so forth, that, that's something that I think people have to get engaged seriously in the political process around that because that's where that gets set. Um, that's not something that disruptive innovation has a heck of a lot to say on. Uh, except to acknowledge that it's happening and that it will probably mean uh, the creation of a much, much better marketplace for a lot of these uh, tools and so forth. And if the goals are aligned around really good things that we feel good about, that could be a tremendous opportunity. Except that...
Go ahead, Dan. We can you can turn your mic back on. Well, it, so we lost you again. You have to just click it once, and it stays on. Uh, you're on now. Well, you were. Click it again one time. Now you're on. Okay. Um, except that you have been talking about in your book the the disruption of the school districts, and um, I mean you're changing from a local democratic control of education to one of marketplace. Now the person that there are the entity that's going to win this marketplace model are the corporations. So you know that's what you're you're pushing our educate the control of our education to to the corporate interests and taking it away from our local democratic government. Now, yes, there are problems with our local democratic control. It is messy, but it's still um, democratic as opposed to corporate. Um, so, so, Dan, I, I guess I'd push back on this. Ultimately, the public is paying for these things as long as it's in public education. And so, to me, local control is alive and well, and I don't see a disruption of the districts. In fact, if you look at our work, uh, I, I tend to think that districts will continue to be where the bulk of this uh, uh, happens. Um, in, in the new book, uh, I, I state that very clearly in that last chapter. Um, in the, uh, and, and I would add, I think that there will be some for-profits that profit enormously from it, and I have no problem with that. Uh, but the public ought to control toward what ends uh, those go. Uh, right now, there are three for-profits that uh, tremendously benefit from it, named McGraw-Hill, Pearson, and Houghton Mifflin. That's not an unusual thing. We just have to think about what are the goals, and that ought to stay in local control and really be a democratic process that the voters control, because ultimately, they're the customers that are paying through this through their tax dollars. And so I think that's tremendously important that the public has a say over what uh, that does and doesn't look like. Michael, so I'm interested because, as I mentioned at the beginning, I feel like the book resists kind of black and white categorization. There were two things in the book that that, uh, that I thought sort of uh, argue this point for you. One was that in that last chapter you talk about the fact that you wrote the chapter to help warn reformers to be wise and realistic. So I didn't get the feeling, I mean, I got the feeling that you were sort of saying, I just want to explain the territory and the landscape in order for everybody to be able to participate. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was your, at one point in the book, you talk about uh, students, other students and parents creating some of the learning material for students. And I felt like, uh, again, you were, um, you, were, you were trying to bridge uh, what would have previously been sort of unbridgeable positions uh, in, in, in bringing that to light. So, so, Steve, I, I appreciate you asking it that way. That's how I saw it um, uh, on, on, on both respects of it. And, and to, the, to the last point, I mean, I think our viewpoint is that for customization to really happen, uh, that it cannot be controlled within one entity that dictates what things do and don't look like. It's going to have to be an unbelievably democratic process of students, parents, teachers, uh, others creating uh, the learning experiences and opportunities for students, whether that's content or whether that's modules or whether that's uh, uh, gaming experiences or whether that's projects for them to do and, and get feedback from mentors. Uh, you know, I, I, for different things, there will be different things that make sense. Um, but, but I think that's precisely right, and, that, and that, that is how, that's very much the spirit in which I, I saw it. And, and, and uh, so I appreciate you bringing that up because I, because on both of those ends, I, th I think that's correct. So certainly, uh, uh, we are leaving tonight with much that still could be said. Michael, I really want to uh, thank you for coming on again. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, these are complex issues. Uh, I appreciate the chance to to have you uh, talk about it in the ways that you have that I think are uniquely informative. Um, I'm a big believer in sort of the Gandhi principle of. Uh, trying to understand everybody and understand the different arguments. And I, in my core, believe that you and Gary both uh, have really valuable things to say in this conversation. And I hope that my job is to bring those out 
uh, in the best possible way. Um, and really appreciate the conversation that takes place. So Steve, thanks Steve, for the I book, just, yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks, being for, the book. thanks for being on tonight. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, I just wanted to thank you again for facilitating these and giving us a place to um, to have these discussions that's really safe. I think it's just an enormous service you do. And I really do think in many ways what, what Gary and I are talking about are actually complementary. And, uh, you know, his area of expertise is definitely not mine. So I, I, I try not to wade there. Um, uh, and, and, and I hope they both bring out about a, a better system in the longer run. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. Thanks again to Illuminate, uh, Learn Central, this project I work on for Illuminate Now, Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, and please, uh, we've got some really fun conversations coming up tomorrow, the discussion, uh, where we ask you what kind of a personal and professional support network would be useful to teachers that, that came from a grassroots effort. Then next week, Karen Cater, uh, David Wiley, Karen Hume. Lots of fun ahead. Thanks again to Michael. Thanks for you who've been here, and uh, thanks to those who are listening to the recording. Really appreciate the chance to explore these issues. Good night. Good night, Michael.